Assuming debate, the Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Oh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm honoured and humbled to serve as a committee member for the Indigenous and Northern Affairs Committee. You know, with the government's commitment to reconciliation and the Prime Minister's vow to enact the uh, 94 recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report, it was clear that the committee would be working on pressing issues. The committee began with an introduction to Indigenous issues. During these meetings, we heard how residential school systems affected Indigenous families and their culture. Although residential schools are often thought of being an issue of the past, the lasting effects are still a major hurdle that continues to plague Indigenous people. Many of the witnesses uh, that appear before the committee have gone to residential schools or have family members or families who attended. Residential schools were designed to break their culture. From their mother tongue to their spiritual beliefs, Indigenous people had to give up who they were. But the greatest trauma was caused by forcefully being removed from their families. When the children returned, they came back to families and a culture that they were no longer a part of. Often, Indigenous people had no way to cope with their trauma. They began to develop mental health issues because there was no belief that things would get better. Many of the survivors, uh, survivors turned to drugs and alcohol to deal with their pain. Without being healthy, they could not hold a job and often fell into poverty. It was shocking to hear that the suicide rate in Indigenous communities across this country ran up to 11 times higher than the non-Indigenous rate. They may have survived the residential schools, but by not having the resources in place to deal with their trauma, the cycle often continues. Indigenous, indigenous communities still experience the trauma of losing their children daily in this country. First Nations Child and Family Services every day takes children from their parents due to, due to neglect. Unfortunately, these children find themselves removed from their families, culture, and community when they are placed in provincial custody in the South. Right now, according to experts, it's not uncommon for 6% of the children on reserves to be in a state of care, in state care. In some communities, the numbers can be, I mean, some communities, the numbers can double. This is totally unacceptable. In 2005, many Canadians across the country were exposed to how broken the system was with the passing of Jordan River Anderson. Jordan was born with a rare muscular disorder. Due, due to his disorder, Jordan spent the first two years of his life in a hospital away from his family. When doctors determined that he was ready to go home, he couldn't. There was an issue with Health Canada and First Nations Child and Family Services. While on the reserve, the health care of Indigenous people is provided by Health Canada and is paid, for the, uh, paid by the federal government. Jordan was in medical foster home because the treatment he needed was only available in Winnipeg, 800 kilometers away from his home. Medical foster homes fall under the care of the First Nation, uh, First Nation Child and Family Services, which is funded by the provinces. Jordan needed medical treatment at home, but the federal and provincial governments could not agree on who would be responsible to fund his home care. Instead of going home, Jordan was forced to wait. Two years later, Jordan died at the age of five, alone in Winnipeg. Jordan never had the opportunity to live with his loving family. He never had a real home. As a father, I find this story painful to tell. I cannot imagine having a child that did not receive care because neither level of government wanted to take responsibility. While some, of, uh, while some find Jordan's story shocking, First Nation Canadians from across this country know this story is still a common one. No child should ever be put in Jordan's situation. That is why Jordan's principle was developed. We must take common sense approach to services. The child, child's welfare should come first. An Indigenous child should never receive services that are lesser than their non-Indigenous peers because of the provincial and federal funding disputes. Members of Parliament on both sides of the House show that they agreed with this sediment in 2007 when they unanimously voted in favour of the private member's motion M296, stating that the government should immediately adopt the child's first principle. Based on Jordan principle, 
to resolve jurisdictional disputes involving care of First Nations children. The vote may have been, uh, the vote may have been unanimous, but the problem did not end with the adoption of M296. When, it, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission released their report, the third call to action was, we call upon all levels of government to fully implement Jordan's principle. On Indigenous and Northern Affairs Committee, we heard Jordan's principle mentioned constantly. There are still First Nation children who do not have the same access to services and opportunities as every Canadian child. The stories are just as heartbreaking as Jordan's. The Liberal Party made a variety of large commitments to the Indigenous people of this country. The Liberals have promised a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship with Indigenous people of this country. They also call for record funding to Indigenous programs and the implementation of the TRC calls to action. They also call for the implementation of the call to action on Jordan's principle. We already know the Liberal government has a questionable track record on their promises. Their first budget exposed what many Canadians already knew, that the Liberals was the party that tells you what you want to hear, but not necessarily what they will do. Just as expected, Budget 2016 failed to deliver on several large commitments to Indigenous Canadians. The record funding that had been promised was often less than what the previous Conservative government had committed to. While the Liberals promised to implement Jordan's principle, Budget 2016 only included $71 million for child welfare. This was a, a far short of the $108.1 million that the former Conservative government said in 2012 was the shortfall. The Liberal government claims that their promises of $634.8 million over five years will make things right. Over half of that budget, uh, over half of that is budgeted after the next election, which can only be described as a plan to deflect criticism. While the Liberal government can break most of their promises without consequences, but the Jordan principle is a matter of human rights. The principle was brought before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal by the Assembly of First Nations and Black Sox, the Executive Director of the First Nation Child and Family Caring Society of Canada. The tribunal ruled the government was not respecting the rights of Indigenous Canadians. In July, the Liberal government submitted a compliance report to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in which they were committed to investing up to $382 million. They also claimed they were compliant. The stakeholders were skeptical. Blackstock lawyers said the government response was vague. He was right. The government presented figures with no plan or timeline. The tribunal, a tribunal agreed with Blackstock. The government was not in compliance. The tribunal found that the government had a narrow interpretation of what the medical needs to be covered, only focusing on acute and complex medical situations. The government had adopted a policy that only applied to Indigenous people, people on reserves. This was not the, the government attempting to live up to its commitments to First Nations. This was a Liberal government attempting to do bare minimum. You cannot do the bare minimum when the welfare of children is on the line. We can't, uh, we can't keep going back and forth in courts. We need to move forward on this issue. When my colleague, the Member of Parliament, for Timmins James Bay presented his motion, he put forward an opportunity to end the stories we hear too often in the media and firsthand at committee. He also put forward a motion that all sides of the House can agree on, not because the tribunal is involved, but because it's the right thing to do. I know that the New Democrats support this motion. I know that many of my Conservative colleagues and I support this motion. Now it's up to the Liberals to make a decision. Hopefully, it's for the children. Questions and comments. The Honourable Member for Timmins, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to say thank you to my colleague. I have enormous respect for the work he does on our committee. And what we've seen today is a government that seems to believe that compliance order the tribunal doesn't apply to them, that have ridiculed the shortfall numbers, saying that they were made up out of thin air, as I think the minister said, cooked up in a back room. When these are the numbers put forward by Cindy Blackstock to the tribunal, right. and they've gone unanswered. But I want to ask my colleague, 
about his concerns about the residential schools because he has heard, like I've heard, the connection, the intimate connection between the suicide crisis and the residential schools. And he's brought forward a motion to committee to study the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation. And the first four recommendations are about the overhaul of child welfare and the implementation of Jordan's principle. Now, the New Democrats support the view that we should be looking at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, and the implementation, my colleague does. I'm concerned that the Liberals are walking away on those commitments. And I want to ask my honourable colleague if he's concerned about any efforts that would happen at our committee if we did not take the time to find out whether this government is actually serious about implementing the promises of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because we know the Prime Minister said that that was going to be his priority. So it is going to be coming before committee. We haven't voted yet. But does my colleague have any concerns that the Liberals are, are against reviewing something as, as simple and straightforward as whether or not Canada is in compliance with the tr uh, recommendations, the call to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Report? The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank you, the member, for his question. Yes, I'm, I'm definitely concerned. Uh, you know, during uh, many of our witnesses, uh, they have spoken, and, and they're concerned that the TRC has to be implemented, all the recommendations. And, you know, there's a feeling that, uh, that this study would be pushed aside, and, and, and I share that with my colleagues uh, uh, from the Conservative side and NDP side. But looking forward, and if we want to make real change, we have to uh, push forward on the TRC recommendations. And we have to be able to, to get the grassroots feeling from the communities we, we, uh, we have a wit as witnesses. So uh, I, moving forward, I, I think that uh, I, hopefully I don't uh, see the Liberals shutting our study down. But there's always hope. Questions and comments? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my colleague for his uh, speech today in the House. One of the things that he raised is with regard to talking about the government not forthcoming with, with enough money, in his opinion. Mr. Speaker, we took very seriously the ruling of the tribunal. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we know that the system is broken and that it has to be reformed as it is related to child services on reserve. That's why, Mr. Speaker, that we moved immediately to invest urgent funding of $71 million this year. But, Mr. Speaker, I want to ask the member this because the amount called for today in the opposition motion is arbitrary, and it's not rooted in a real assessment of need. The tribunal said that the government should invest based on need, so I would like to ask the member if he feels that governments should invest based on the need for financial support for children in First Nations or just based on a number that the NDP would like to put in a motion. The Honourable Member for Fort McMurray, Cold Lake. Well, thank you for the member across the aisle. I, I, I believe that what, uh, what need has to come money. I mean, you can't have both. And, you know, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals have set aside $634.6 million worth of child welfare funding, and most of it will not be seen until after the next federal election. Are the Liberals trying to justify their negligence by saying that of that $634.8 million, they cannot find the money to fund this potential life-saving initiative? 